Welcome to 2023 Tencent We Submit. We are in a galaxy with billions of stars, uh, but it's only recently that we have understood that most of these stars have planets. Um, there is good reason to have a planet on a star is you form a planet at the same time you form a star. Everything at the beginning is a bit cloud of hydrogen. They collapse, they form stars, young stars, and then around of these stars, sometimes with the leftover, they are planets. This is what we call the planetary theory. Now, the idea of planet on the stars is pretty obvious because we are in a system with planet and the star, the sun. But it took a long time to understand what about the other stars? And for a long time, we thought that every star had planet like our own solar system. And this is the story I want to tell you, because the story is not exactly uh, this. Um, we realize that our system is maybe special, and it opens up a lot of questions about what about life. So how do we detect planet? Well, first, a planet is a very faint object next to a star, which is extremely bright. So you cannot take your telescope and look at the star and see the planet. You're completely blinded. So what do you do? Well, you use tricks. The tricks is when you observe a star, if the planet is orbiting the star, what is going to happen then is there will be a motion due to the planet that you can detect on the star. It's related to the gravity. So the big orbit that the star is making corresponds to a small orbit. Um, uh, the big orbit that the planet is making corresponds to a small orbit for the star. Now, if you use the right equipment, you can see these motions. You can see, more specifically, the change of speed of the star. And you use a techniques called Doppler techniques, similarly that the way we measure the speed on the car. And um, you can detect these tiny motions and guess there is a planet. So if you got really lucky, and then at the very moment when the planet goes in front of the star, we call that the transit, you can also detect a planet like that. Now, 30 years ago, what we did um, is to build a machine, a complete new kind of machine that could detect these tiny motions. It was a brand new technology. We have been using uh, new optics, uh, fiber optics, uh, a new computing facility that was a kind of a big change uh, at that moment. So we had this kind of very powerful machine we could have next to us in the labs. And with all this new technology, we designed a program that could detect these tiny motions that corresponds to about the speed of a running man. Now, what we found was a big surprise, because at that moment, when we started the program, we realized that one of the stars, that is called 51 Peg, have a planet. But that planet is not like we know on a solar system. It's a bit like Jupiter, it's a massive planet, big planet. But Jupiter is orbiting our sun very far away, I mean, much farther away than for the Earth. But that Jupiter, that we detect on that planet was very, very close. So close that it was rusted because of the radiation that um, received um, from the stars. We call them hot Jupiter. So that planet took a bit more than four days to go around the orbit and to be compared with the 365 days um, that we take that we, on Earth um, to, um, to complete completely the orbit. And that was the beginning of the revolutions because people realized that there are planets, and they may be very, very different. Actually, since then, we have a lot of planets, it's thousands of planets. And this is a picture that gives you all the kind of planets that we have detected so far orbiting other stars. What is fascinating in this picture is they are organized in terms of temperature of the planet and density of the planet. In the solar system, we have the dense planet, like the Earth, Mercury, they are rocky, they dense, and we have planets which is big, which are big, but not that dense, like Jupiter, for example. Now, we have realized that there are all kinds of planets that you can find on other stars, any density, some that are like 
the Earth, very compact, like rocks, and other extremely fluffy, like Jupiter. And also, we realized that some of the planets were very close to the stars, like the one that we detected 30 years ago, extremely hot, and other were a bit farther out, um, like the Earth, or even farther out, uh, like Jupiter, and very cold. So the universe is full of diversity and full of all kinds of planets. And that was, in a sense, a revolution. Because up to that point, we thought that everything would be exactly the same as the solar system. Actually, it is not. There is way more diversity in the planetary system that we thought. Now, what is fascinating here, if amongst this diagram, you see there is the Earth. It's blinking now in the diagram. So the Earth in the, is the middle of a, all kinds of planets. So in, in a way, the planet Earth is not special in terms of planet mass and size. What makes the Earth special is because there is life on the Earth, and we're going to come back on that. Now, what we can do with all these many planets, we can look at the structure of the planet. To do that, I have to bring a kind of a complicated diagram that combines two measurements that we have on each of these planets on other stars. It's the mass of the planet and the size of the planet. With the mass and the size, you compute something that we call the density of the planet. And you see, to help you to read this diagram, some of the well-known planets like Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune. And there is a couple of, uh, um, I think, modeling that has been added to all the data points that you see on this diagram, which is where you expect the density to be for a specific structure like planet like Jupiter, for example, which is a giant planet. And you have this, this uh, hatched line that cross Jupiter and Neptune on the diagram. This is where you expect a Jupiter to be. So you can move the mass of Jupiter a little bit. It will change a, a little bit the, the size of the planet and according to this density law. Now, of course, if you change drastically the nature of the planet, the planet will not be at the same location. Neptune, for example, you see, uh, for the corresponding mass of Neptune, you have an object which is much smaller, much more compact from what you would expect if Neptune would have a Jupiter-like density. And there is good reason for that, because Neptune, in a sense, is a bit like Jupiter, but without the light gas that is hydrogen and helium. So because there is not that much hydrogen and helium in Neptune, the corresponding density is much more compact. And you can go on and on until you reach this green actual line, which is exactly the location of any planet that would look like a rocky planet. So we have the rocky planet that tell you the planet is made of rocks, extremely dense. And in between, we have all kinds of planets. The diagram here displays what's called a water world planet. It's a planet made of water. But essentially, when you see all these points, all these data we have right now, there is a kind of a diversity here. And you can have anything. And we're a bit lost. That's why we invented names like Super Earth, Mini Neptune, Super Neptune, because we don't really know what they look like. And that is one of the big puzzles right now, is how can we make sense to all of this? In the solar system, we have essentially only three categories. We have the rocky planets, we have the giant planet, like Jupiter and Saturn, and we have what's called the ice giants, like Neptune, for example, or Uranus. But in the reality of the diversity of all the planets in the universe, we have way more planets of all kinds, and we have mixing between all these types, making the study and the understanding of the formation of the solar system way more complicated than we thought. Now, I said we had planet, we have plenty of planet, we know the mass, we know the size, we know the density, but actually we can do way more. And that's the fascination of the field because we're using this very special moment and special configuration that we call a transit. How does it look? Well, if you got lucky, you can be just on the right angle of view and um, you have the planet crossing in front of the star. It's a very special configuration. You need to be lucky because most of the time you don't have the crossing, but sometimes you do. And in these configurations, you have two special moments. One of them, when the planet is hiding behind the star. Well, you may ask yourself, what, what, what do we do with that? Well, actually, we do something very, very important for us. We have this very moment as an absolute reference where the light that we can measure with a telescope on Earth or in space is only the light coming from the stars because the planet is behind, so we're pretty sure there is no light from the planet. 
as soon as the planet starts to emerge out of the star, it's not hidden anymore, then there is a bit of the light that comes from the planet. Think about the light which is reflected from the planet, like the moon, for example, and also the natural thermal emission of the planet. So this tiny difference uh, is used today to measure directly the thermal temperature of a planet. So this is how we can tell you without having a picture, but using this special moment, what is the temperature of a planet. And we can do even more, because when the planet is in front of the star, no, there is a fraction of the light from the star which is hidden, doesn't reach the telescope. We use this kind of special moment, this kind of drop in intensity of the light we receive from the star to compute the size of the planet, the diameter of the planet. Well, actually we can do way more because depending on the nature of the atmosphere of the planet, some light don't cross the atmosphere while some light cross the atmosphere. And we know all that. And when you see, look at the sunset, we see that the red color cross the atmosphere. That's why the sun becomes red when you have the sunset. Well, actually, when you don't have a sunset, the sun is more like a yellowish. So this is exactly this property we're using. Because of the red light tend to cross better the atmosphere than the blue light, if you observe the transit, this very special moment, in two colors, what you're going to do is actually you're going to see a bigger planet in the blue than in the red. And actually, you can do way more because you can probe and test the nature of the atmosphere. To show you that, I need to show you an image. Imagine that you are right now uh, orbiting around the Earth and you're taking a picture for example, from the uh, ISS, and you have this picture when you use your cell phone in the visible light, and what you see here is just the tiny um, uh, size of the atmosphere, which is the reason why we are alive, just 10 kilometers that is protecting us, and is the part which, where we can breathe, and we have the oxygen, and you have the moon just behind. Now, I would like you to pay attention to the tipping point when the moon on that picture is getting very close to the atmosphere of uh, the planet. If I do exactly the same picture, I take exactly the same picture, but I use a red filter or red wavelength, it's called the infrared. So what I'm, going, what I'm going to do is I'm going to see the bottom part of the, of the surface of the, of the planet without the atmosphere. And you will see there is a bit more distance between the, um, the edge of the moon and, and, uh, and the, the planet Earth. Look at that, you see it takes much more space. So here we don't have any atmosphere. This is what's called the infrared thermal emissions. It's just the heat of the surface of the planet that we detect. Now I can do a trick. I can use a specific wavelength that I know will be absorbed in a very upper atmosphere by a uh, an, um, component, an element that we call ozone, which is protecting us from the deadly UV radiations uh, from the sun. And in that case, the planet will look bigger. You see, I, I have this feeling that compare if I go back to the, uh, the planet when it's red right now and the one with the ozone, so I have a feeling that the planet gets bigger. So this trick that measuring the transit uh, in different color, uh, we're using it to get an idea what is inside the atmosphere. It's a bit like an X-ray we're doing. So this connection between the size of the planet that depends and change depending on the color is used atmospheric spectroscopy. And recently, we had a major step, a major uh, measurement that we did with uh, one of the space observatories called the James Webb Space Telescope is this. So this is the change of the size of a planet which is about the size of Neptune, depending of the wavelength of color I observe it. So it is going up and down, so depending on uh, the color you're doing. And if you analyze this in great detail, you realize that you can understand this, all this complex picture uh, with all the data points in terms of molecular composition of the atmosphere. So with these measurements, with that planet, what I know is I know there are specific components which is kind of not similar, but not so far from the one we have um, in the, on, on the Earth. We have CO2, we have uh, methanes, and we even have kind of uh, advanced um, organic molecules. That's the first time that we measure uh, an atmosphere of a planet 
with such a molecules, with such a great detail. And this is one of the many, because there will be way more in the future. So you see, we don't only measure the size and the mass of the planet, but we can tell you what is going on in the atmosphere of the planet. And this is fascinating, because in a way, without seeing the planet, we can tell you what's going on on that planet. So there is one planet that we know very well, that is the Earth. And to give you a little bit of a perspective, if you imagine that people observe, people, alien uh, civilization would observe the Earth and study the atmosphere, what exactly would have them learn from these observations? Well, it depends on when they observe the planet. Here you see what's called a time history of the Earth. We start at the bottom when we assemble um, the planet and we move up like a watch a little bit. Uh, uh, and then we have the, the, the formation of the planet. We have the infall of all the material that are critical because a lot of uh, carbon is, is brought by the infall of material. Possibly water as well is coming at that moment. Of course, there is the beginning of the volcanic activities. So you exhaust material which have, which have sunk uh, into the atmosphere of the planet. You end up with an atmosphere which is very likely a CO2-rich atmosphere uh, and with water there. And at some time, which is about more than almost 4 billion years ago, the chemistry on the surface of the planet did something strange, that looked a bit unusual. They started what I call a prebiotic element, building some component that would then drive the beginning of life. And then at that moment, as soon as you start life, the chemistry become alive in a sense, then the chemistry of life started to impact on the planet and completely change the atmosphere of the planet. This is the reason why we have so much oxygen right now. All the oxygen that we breathe in has been produced by life. And essentially, all the carbon as well that we're having and, and in, on the planet has been reprocessed uh, by life. So that planet has now an evolution which is an connected to the fact that life started a bit more than three and a half billion years ago. So the question is then, well, what makes this planet alive? Do we have other planet where similar events happen? Does it mean that Mars had something similar as well, or Venus in the past, and maybe lost? When you start life, does it mean that you may start it, but then life may disappear? So all these are open questions. And it is very, I mean, old question in a sense to ask the question, are we alone in the universe? But what makes the, the world fascinating right now and the situation unique is we are not that far of bringing answer by just observations. So, of course, it's a very complicated problem and there is not a simple solution for that. And to give you an idea why the problem is so complicated, you have to just look at life as it is today on the planet. So there is a famous description of life, which is called tree of life, which is the diversity of any, anything alive right now on the planet. So you see the diversity of all the, um, uh, the, the, uh, um, the true productions of the beginning of life on the planet, going for the bacteria until the, until the mammals. So there is an important element here, which is the time. So the time in this diagram corresponds to how far you are from the center. So the outskirt, all the outskirt of this diagram, anything which is just at the end of it is what we have today. So today it's immense diversity and we can trace back the diversity by specific event when there is a diversification to the always a point when we, co we consider to be the last common ancestor. Now, the challenge of this diagram is we have well, if you're asking where is the, the human here, it's at very, very bottom on the right side. So this is really where you are. <laughs> so we're really at the end of the process here. But, but the question is, how do you end up like that? Um, how, does it, how do you know that? Well, the challenge is the answer lies in the middle here. This is this red element, which is the beginning of life. And, and the difficulty is there may not be an easy connection from life as we see it today, connecting with what you need as a condition for life to start. Now, what is even more interesting in this diagram is to ask yourself the questions, well, what does it mean starting life? Do we see today life starting 
No, actually, we don't. We see life repeating. So life right now just repeat and repeat again something which is absolutely uh, working uh, with a great efficiency. This is why all the life is built up on the same mechanism. The DNA, RNA, it's just a universal process here on life. Now, so we don't see today the beginning of life. And there may be a very interesting reason why. It may be the condition to initiate this translation from just something which is matter to something alive is not met. Why? Because when you go back at the time life started on Earth, actually the picture of what Earth looked like was very different. This is Earth. I go back in time, four billion years ago. The atmosphere is completely different. The, the, uh, the activity and the volcanic activity is different. The number of infall of material is much more intense than it is today. So this is the beginning of life. So the question is how much this is happening on the planet? How much can we detect some of these molecules on other planet. And I hope I convince you that we can, because I show you just one result before. So it's about now collecting the data, observing as much as we can all this planet that we're detecting, detecting even more planets that look alike the Earth. Today we don't have exactly the same planet that the Earth, but we have rocky planet, we have planet that receive the same amount of energy. And, and then at some point, producing true image. So this is not so far from the future. And uh, we, have, we all know all this famous picture, which is blue dot, which is at the time a spacecraft took a picture back on Earth. And this is what you do when you take a picture of planet Earth from the solar system. Well, in the not so far future, we will be able to do exactly the same, but on other stars. It's complicated. You need to deal with the extreme light from the stars, but it's possible. There is a series of gigantic telescopes, is one of them right now, which is being built, that is built and designed to do that kind of picture. When you start doing that, then you open so many possibilities. One of them is at some point, eventually, you are able to record a detailed spectra. What is the true composition of the atmosphere? You can even see maybe the seasonal effect on the planet. And who knows what we're going to see? In that case, if you would do that from another star and looking at us as of today, this is exactly what you would see, that kind of picture. And from that picture, you will find out there is a lot of oxygen, there is methane, there is a lot of element that is related to the, the origin of life. And you would conclude that something biologically active is going on on that planet. That's exactly what we're doing today. How long it will take to get the answer? We don't know. But there is so much people, so much investment right now, I would not be surprised that in the next 10 to 50 years, we have finally understood how do we sit, not only in terms of system, but how life starts, and what does it mean, life in the universe. Thank you very much.